Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, for our 11th regional uh, uh, webinar across uh, the province outlining the Ontario government's uh, supports uh, uh, for small businesses uh, and others in the heritage, sport, tourism, and culture industries uh, in light of the impacts of uh, COVID-19. Appreciate you joining us uh, here today. My name is Derek Rowland. I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff and Director of Communications to the Honourable Lisa McLeod, Ontario's Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Culture Industries, and I get uh, the pleasure of being your moderator here today. Before we begin today's formal presentation, I'm going to turn it over to your local MVP, Sam Oosterhoff, to provide some introductory remarks. MVP Oosterhoff, over to you. Thank you very much, Derek, and welcome to all those who are joining us this morning. A special welcome to uh, the Honourable Minister Lisa McLeod and her team who are here. Uh, as you all know, uh, Niagara has been hit extremely hard by COVID-19, both uh, in terms of real numbers of the case, uh, cases of the virus, as well as the economic impacts. As you know, the numbers that came out uh, recently show the impacts in our service sector, especially with a high emphasis on tourism and hospitality uh, and the hospitality sector, uh, creating many, many jobs in our area that have unfortunately been impacted negatively by COVID-19 and also uh, by the restrictions put in place to stop the spread of this terrible virus. Uh, Minister McLeod has been a champion of Niagara, is a champion of tourism, uh, sport and culture across the province. And she's joining us here today to walk us through some of the particular uh, supports that have been put in place by the provincial government. I want to acknowledge a number of different elected officials who are on the line today, councillors from the town of Grimsby, from Pelham, uh, from St. Catharines, Niagara Falls. Uh, we have people from all over the region representing a great deal of different uh, industries and we want to ensure that you are able to access the supports that are available. So the minister will walk you through that but I just want to encourage you to reach out both to her and to I uh, after this meeting with questions, comments, concerns. This is going to be a fairly brief uh, walk through because we understand the importance of ensuring everyone is able to get back to their day but we want to also make sure you're aware of what these resources are. So uh, my door is always open, the minister's door is always open. Uh, we're here to ensure that we're able to get through this and rebuild Ontario and Niagara stronger and better than ever. So thank you so much for your determination, your sacrifice over the past year. Uh, we are so encouraged by the incredible spirit that so many of you have shown and we are committed to working with you as we recover. Minister McLeod, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Sam. And it's so wonderful to work with you. You've been such a champion and advocate for the Niagara region and all things Niagara region. But in particular with my files, uh, you, you uh, have gone above and beyond, of course, recognizing how important tourism and culture and sport are. And of course, heritage to the beautiful Niagara region um, and the city of Niagara Falls, and as well as other places. I just, before I get started, want to acknowledge a couple of my friends on the line. I, I see my old friend, Jim Bradley, who I served many years with on the in the legislature is here. Anthony Anunciata, who's been doing some incredible work with our ministry um, for tourism, Tim Jennings and Joel Noden, and, and just so many others, Betty DeSoro. Um, you, you know, you guys are working so hard uh, to make sure that Niagara Falls uh, and Niagara region uh, come through this. So uh, I, I just want to start off uh, briefly by saying, you know, Niagara Falls and Niagara region will have a particularly important role in the economic recovery of the tourism uh, industry, as well as our cultural industry. And we'll be starting to work on the Ontario uh, Travel Incentive very shortly in order to encourage people when it's safer to do so, uh, to go back and, and look at some of our amazing tourism opportunities. Uh, that's why we're committed to uh, ensuring that uh, Niagara 2022 um, proceeds and it proceeds safely. It's also why we're going to continue to invest in the Niagara Parks Commission, uh, one of the agencies within this ministry, um, and uh, one, one of the uh, opportunities for us to continue to, to build back better. Um, I'll, I'll also talk a little bit about some of the, cha the changes that we'll be making in the ministry to, uh, to address some of the challenges that you're facing uh, and to support you as we build out. Uh, many of you are aware that we released a white paper prior to Christmas. And so we are working through that process with our multi-year plan planning within the ministry um, to make sure that we're able to support places like the Shaw Festival. Um, and we are able to uh, continue to support people going to uh, the wine country um, and making sure that that they take in the spectacular falls. Um, 
my team today, uh, between uh, Debbie Jewell and Patricia Vina, will walk you through uh, the most recent changes that we made yesterday. Some of you may have been on the line with myself and Premier Ford as we start to slowly ease restrictions and reopen the economy. Um, we begin to do that transition next week and in some places across Ontario uh, this week. Uh, we'll talk about what that means uh, for our sectors in particular. Uh, for example, performance arts. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about ski hills and sports, uh, those types types of things. Um, we'll also walk through uh, a deck on the Ontario Arts Council, which will be seeing an increase uh, of $25 million this year um, to support our co core cultural institutions, and that would include the Shaw Festival. A million dollars of that will be going toward um, supporting individual artists as well, which is quite important. Uh, the second uh, program that we'll be unveiling very shortly is the Ontario Trillium Foundation Community Building Fund. Uh, that will be a $105 million fund dedicated to uh, restoring and recovery of tourism, culture, sport, and heritage, as well as for our not-for-profit sector. So that will be $30 million uh, this fiscal year and uh, $75 million the following fiscal year. And that's in addition to the existing $103 million um, um, Ontario Trillium Foundation um, budget. Um, in total, in the next few months, we'll be rolling out $302 million from this ministry um, in new funding, and we will be making sure that uh, that that message gets out. We'll continue to work with all of our stakeholders and industry partners in order to support you. Uh, we're, we're also going to flow um, $20 million through uh, the new Reconnect Festival and Event Program, which will be unveiled uh, imminently, um, and we're looking forward to that. So, that's where we're at in our ministry. However, in other, our sister ministries, there are available supports for you uh, in order to uh, support your small business or your not-for-profit or your cultural attraction. And so we will have, after my, my ministry officials speak, uh, the ministry officials from the Ministry of Finance, uh, and they'll walk you through the, the various programs that we have, for example, the small business grant of up to $20,000, um, and they'll walk you through the PPE uh, one-time grant of $1,000, as well as the property tax and energy bill um, recovery uh, support that, that's available. Um, and finally, we'll have a ministry official from the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services who will walk you through the portal in how you can actually make um, an application for these processes. At, at any time you have a question, there is a chat box, a Q&A box at the, uh, at the bottom of your screen, and you're able to um, ask a question there and my, my staff will uh, be very quick and, and try and, and, and uh, address your question immediately. Um, alternatively, you're always welcome to email me at minister.mcleod at ontario.ca for any questions that you may have. So you know what, yesterday I think we saw a lot of light at the end of a very long and dark tunnel and so I think today is an appropriate day to talk about how we can get those supports into your hands and start with the economic recovery um, in the tourism, culture, heritage and sports sectors and in particular particular in the region of Niagara. So with that, Derek, I'll turn it over to you and uh, we can start uh, the uh, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister MPP Oosterhoff for your kind words. Um, so as uh, the Minister mentioned, we're going to be doing uh, things a little bit different uh, from uh, previous presentations uh, following the government's uh, announcement yesterday uh, as we uh, begin to reopen uh, portions of the province uh, following the end of the stay at uh, home order, as well as uh, we, as we transition uh, public health units uh, into the existing uh, uh, framework. So uh, to highlight some of the additional changes and what it means particularly for our sectors, uh, we do have uh, Patricia Vina, who is a director within our Support division, as well as Debbie Jewell joining us on the line for a presentation about yesterday's announcement related to our sectors. Um, so with that, uh, Patricia, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Derek. So as the minister mentioned, as part of reopening, we will be returning to the COVID-19 response framework. As of February 10th, the following public health units will move into the green zone. Those are Hastings and Prince Edward County's health unit, Kingston, Frontenac, and Lennox Addington Health Unit, Renfrew County and District Health Unit. All other public health units will move to the framework on February the 16th, with Toronto, Peel, and York on February the 22nd. Each public health unit will be put into the appropriate zone based on their case counts. As part of the framework, there are updates relevant to heritage, sport, tourism, and culture sectors, which myself and my colleague Debbie Jewell will go briefly over with you. Next slide, please. Ski hills. So ski and most other outdoor snow and recreational amenities can operate except for the shutdown zone in gray. 
any person, use, person using a downhill ski lift, including a surface lift, must wear a mask or face covering. In addition, they must comply with general capacity limits and ski equipment can be rented, but it must be cleaned and disinfected as frequently as necessary. Next slide, please. Children and adolescents can also be offered in the green, yellow, orange, and red zones with conditions. There are 100 people if your region is in the green, yellow, and orange zones outdoors, and 25 people if your region is in the red control zone. However, in the gray lockdown and shutdown zone, lessons are prohibited. In addition, there are face coverings required. So any person who enters the ski hill is required to maintain a physical distance of at least two meters from any other person using the amenity, unless a ski lift that has a surface lift, using a ski lift chair, if at least one empty seat is left between any person who are not members of a single household, a parasport athlete and their attendant or guide, or with members of the same household. Maintaining a two meter physical distance is not always achievable while on ski lifts, which is why coverings are face coverings are mandatory in these settings. Next slide, please. In returning back to the framework, indoor and outdoor recreation may operate in all zones with the exception of the gray zone, provided they comply with prescribed conditions. So in green, yellow, indoor and outdoor recreation can open with the two meter distance, 50 per room indoors and 100 outdoors. In the orange, there is 50 patrons total indoors and still 100 outdoors. However, there are some exceptions for fitness classes. They can open, however, it must be 10 per class indoors, 25 outdoors, and there's a three meter distance in the yellow and orange restriction zones. In the red control, we have indoor and outdoor recreation that can open with 10 patrons total indoors and 25 outdoors. And in addition, training sessions for members of a sports team that do not include games or scrimmages may occur. In the gray shutdown lockdown, indoor and outdoor recreation is closed. There is only a few exceptions, which enable high performance sport athletes and professional leagues to play and practice, and for people with disabilities to engage in physical therapy with certain circumstances. Next slide, please. I'll turn it over to Debbie. Okay, thanks Patricia and uh, good morning to everyone out there. Um, I'm going to run through quite a few slides related to tourism and culture uh, uh, facilities, starting with cinemas. So first drive-in cinemas may operate in all zones uh, except in shutdown areas, provided they comply with other driving conditions and I'll be addressing those in a future slide. Cinemas are permitted to operate indoor in the green, yellow, or orange zones with restrictions. Cinemas must remain closed in regions that are in the red and gray lockdown zones unless the facility is used for the purposes of rehearsing or performing a recorded or broadcast concert, artistic event, theatrical performance, or other performance. And only if these conditions are met. And these are similar to uh, other performing arts venue conditions. So no spectators are permitted. Every performer or person who provides work for the cinema must maintain a physical distance of at least two meters from every, every other person, except if it's necessary for the purposes of the performance or rehearsal that the performers or persons who provide work for the cinema must be closer to each other and where necessary for the purposes of health and safety. Singers and players of brass or wind instruments must be separated from any other performers by plexiglass or some other impermeable barrier. Uh, and cinemas must remain closed in regions that are in the gray shutdown zone. Next slide. So for performing arts facilities, concert venues and theaters are able to open with conditions in the green, yellow and orange zones, but they must remain closed in regions that are in the red and gray lockdown zones. And that's, this is with certain exempt, ex, exemptions. So in the red and gray zones, concert venues and theaters may open if the facility is used for the purposes of rehearsing or performing a recorded broadcast concert, artistic event, theatrical performance or other performance subject to the conditions that I just mentioned for the uh, cinemas. 
listed there below. So next slide. For drive-in and drive-through venues, other than in the shutdown zone, drive-in and drive-through entertainment venues across the province can open for events, such as movies, theaters, concerts, theatrical productions, performances, or artistic events, provided they meet conditions outlined in the regulations. Drive-through and drive-in venues across the province must adhere to the following conditions. So customers must stay inside the vehicle, except where necessary to purchase admission, food or beverages, to use a washroom or as otherwise required for reasons of health and safety. Vehicles must be separated by a minimum of two meters and customers must remain in a motor vehicle designed to be closed to the elements. Staff and crew members must observe physical distancing at all times, subject only to limited exemptions. Face coverings in all indoor settings with some exceptions, including while consuming food or drink, or as may be necessary for the purposes of health and safety. And associated conditions related to food and beverage service must also be followed according to zone. Next slide. So short-term rentals in the gray shutdown and lockdown zone, short-term rentals, including cabins and cottages are only permitted or provided to individuals in need of housing. In the green, yellow, orange, and red zones, all short-term rentals, including cabins, cottages, homes, hunting and fishing camps, resorts, houseboats, condominiums, and B&Bs are permitted to operate. Ice fishing huts may be rented if the hut is used only by members of the same household, and it is not to be used overnight. Uh, and these requirements do not apply if the person is renting the ice fishing hut for the purpose of exercising an Aboriginal or treaty right. Next slide. Other accommodations, hotels, motels, lodges, resorts, and other shared rental accommodations, including student residents, are permitted to open. In the red and gray zones, communal steam rooms and saunas on the premises, premises must be closed. In the gray zone, any indoor pools, whirlpools, indoor fitness centers, and other indoor recreational facilities that are part of the operation of the, these businesses must be closed. Next slide. Restaurants, bars, and other food or drink establishments are permitted to operate in all zones subject to conditions and rules outlined in the regulations for the various zones. And these vary significantly between zones, so you should really refer to the specific measures for your area. But generally, indoor dining is permitted subject to conditions in the green, yellow, orange, and red zones, including capacity limits for indoor dining. In the gray uh, lockdown and shutdown zones, takeout, drive-through and delivery are only permitted, including the sale of alcohol. Nightclubs and strip clubs are only permitted to open if they operate as a food or drink establishment and they are subject to conditions that apply to restaurants, bars and other food or drink establishments. Next, uh, museums galleries, aquariums, zoos, science centers, landmarks, historic sites, botanical gardens, and similar attractions are permitted to open in the green, yellow, orange, and red zones with conditions. And regardless of the permitted zone, the person responsible for the business must ensure that the attraction enables members of the public to maintain a physical distance of at least two meters from other persons. And if washrooms are made available to the public, they must be cleaned and disinfected uh, frequently as is necessary to maintain a sanitary environment. Interactive and high contact exhibits can only remain open if located in the green, yellow or orange zones with frequent cleaning and disinfection as necessary to maintain a sanitary condition. Some parts of these attractions may be impacted by the changes to other sections of the regulation and they should be considered. For example, if there's a restaurant or cafeteria on the site. In the gray lockdown zone, museums, galleries, etc., must be closed to the public with the exception that in the gray lockdown zone, these institutions may open to provide drive-in or drive-through access to the public if the specified drive-in drive-through conditions set out in the regulations are followed. Otherwise, all of these attractions must be closed in the gray lockdown zone. Public libraries on the next slide. Libraries in the green, yellow, orange, and red zones can remain open subject to conditions. Library patrons can access circulating materials that are shelved 
or in other publicly accessible areas of the library. In the gray lockdown zone, libraries uh, in, yeah, in the shutdown and gray lockdown zones may open with the following conditions. Circulating materials must be reserved over the telephone or online. Circulating materials may only be exchanged with members of the public through contactless drop-off, pickup or delivery. Patrons must only be permitted to enter the premises to facilitate contactless drop-off and pickup or to access computers, photocopiers or similar services. Patrons must not be permitted to be in the book stacks or to handle circulating materials that are shelved. Circulating materials returned to the library must be disinfected or quarantined. In addition, libraries may offer mental health, addiction, social and child care services with some conditions. On the next slide, related to film and TV, commercial film and television production activities and supporting activities such as hair, makeup and wardrobe are permitted across the province in all zones, provided that the activities are conducted in accordance with all applicable regulatory and other public health requirements and restrictions. The following restrictions apply. No studio audiences may be permitted on the film or television set. The set must be configured and operated in a way as to enable persons on the set to maintain a physical distance of at least two meters from other persons, ex except where necessary for the filming of film or television production. Persons who provide hair and makeup services must wear appropriate personal protective equipment. S singers and players of brass or wind instruments must be separated from any other performers by plexiglass or some other impermeable barrier. Film and television sets are permitted to take place at locations that are otherwise required to be closed to the public under the regulations made under the Reopening Ontario Act. And for film and television production businesses located in the gray or lockdown zone, a COVID-19 safety plan is required. So that's the end of the overview and uh, all of this information is available on the government's reopening website and uh, we'll be discussing some of the links to that information at the end. Um, the next slide, uh, as the Minister mentioned, the 2020 Provincial Budget announced two programs to support tourism, culture and sport organizations. And the first one is the Community Building Fund. Uh, and as the Minister mentioned, the province is investing over 100 million over two years to develop a community building fund that supports community tourism, culture, sport organizations, which are experiencing significant, significant financial pressures due to the pandemic. These organizations support community engagement, tourism and recreation through a variety of attractions, experiences, events and activities. So funding will, uh, will be available to not-for-profit organizations and municipalities and the program will be delivered by the Ontario Trillium Foundation with two streams. The first stream will support local community tourism, heritage, sport and culture not-for-profits such as museums, local theaters, fairs, and cultural institutions to help sustain their operations in the short term and create new attractions, experiences, and events. And the second stream is funding for municipalities and not-for-profit sport and recreation organizations to make investments in infrastructure, rehabilitation, and renovation in order to meet public health protocols and local community needs. So the Ontario Trillium Foundation has been selected as the program delivery agent. They're well positioned to deliver funding to municipalities, Indigenous communities and the not-for-profit sector. And they have strong relationships with sector stakeholders and experience delivering grants on behalf of the government in a timely manner. Uh, they have robust systems in place for processing and evaluating funding applications and for tracking and reporting and on um, on results of these programs. So details of this fund are being finalized currently and more information will be forthcoming in the near future. On the next slide, the second program, which the minister mentioned is the emergency support for core arts organizations. And again, the provincial budget announced that the government is providing one-time emergency funding of 25 million for Ontario arts institutions to help cover operating losses incurred as a result of COVID-19. This funding will help these organizations remain solvent and prepare for a time when they can fully reopen their facilities, resume full programming and welcome back their visitors and audiences. In this case, the Ontario Arts Council has been selected as a program delivery agent based on their expertise and their history of funding Ontario's core arts organizations, including major organizations. 
The agency has robust systems in place for processing and evaluating funding applications and for tracking and reporting on results. Again, details of this funding are currently being finalized and more information will be coming uh, in the days ahead. Finally, uh, the last slide, uh, this is um, just some information uh, and a follow-up email will be sent to all participants on this, um, on this webinar with information uh, that's on your screen there. Uh, and there are links to all of this information and that will be sent to you. So I will turn it over back to Derek. Thank you very much, uh, Debbie. And yes, just referring to those additional resources uh, there, um, the government is uh, updating the ELAWS uh, website, which uh, outlines specifically uh, the regulations uh, for our sectors uh, and uh, the applicable laws, uh, depending on where you fall within the framework. So those uh, links will be provided to, to you uh, following uh, this uh, presentation so that if uh, you are a business and you need to look at uh, the regulations in greater detail or consulting with your local public health unit, um, you can consult uh, uh, those resources available law online as soon as they're available. We're hearing that the Ministry of Health will be updating it later today, so they should be uh, available for you then. Um, thank you very much, uh, Debbie and Patricia, for walking everyone uh, through that uh, yesterday's announcement. I know it's uh, uh, very important to many people, uh, but also something that uh, many of us have been looking uh, forward to for quite some time. And it's only thanks to all of Ontarians' uh, hard work, uh, um, helping to stay home and stop the spread of COVID-19, are we actually able uh, to reopen the province. So uh, thank you to everyone for your hard work on that. And let's just keep that uh, up uh, so that uh, we can continue to drive the case count down and get back uh, to a full and robust recovery. But in order to do that, of course, uh, the government recognizes uh, that uh, we need to provide uh, some interim support to, to protect capacity and has rolled out a number of uh, different programs, including small business supports uh, um, grants uh, up to $20,000 through the Ministry of uh, Finance. And so it's my pleasure to turn it over to Tim Sherman, who is an Assistant Deputy Minister in Ministry of Finance uh, to walk through the small business support grants uh, program, as well as discuss some of the eligibility uh, requirements uh, in order to qualify for that. Uh, um, essentially, if uh, you were impacted by the lockdown and forced to close, so, or previously um, the restrictions that were put in place, uh, uh, you, uh, you will be uh, eligible for this uh, program, but I'll let Tim speak uh, to that in a little bit more detail. So, Tim, over to you. Thank you for that. So, it's going to provide a kind of a high-level overview of, of the grant and um, hopefully be a helpful scene setter before folks take you through the detail of the of the portal. So turning to slide two, government announced uh, the move to a, to a broader province-wide shutdown on December the 21st and at the same time announced that it would be introducing a new Ontario small business support grant in recognition of the impact that the shutdown would have on Ontario small businesses. It's worth noting that this new grant is over and above uh, other existing programs that the province has put in place, such as the property tax and energy rebates, um, or the support that's available to businesses through many uh, federal programs. So the new grant will provide a minimum of 10,000 and up to 20,000 for eligible small businesses that are expected to experience a minimum of a 20% decline in revenue. So every small business will be able to use the support to navigate the challenging times and whatever makes the most sense for them. Um, I think all of you on this call will have a much better sense of some of the, the ways in which businesses will be able to use this support. Um, and there are three basic eligibility requirements in the bottom of the slide, which are probably a helpful framework to use when thinking about um, eligibility for the program. So first, the business needs to be either closed or significantly restricted by the provincial shutdown. And we have a list of businesses that, or categories of businesses that meet that eligibility later on in the slide deck. And the portal, of course, and the application will make that, that clear. Second, this is targeted at small businesses. Um, and so the definition uh, that is being used for this program is common in, in other contexts. And it's having less than 100 employees. So basically between zero and 99 employees at the enterprise level. And finally, the business needs to be able to demonstrate that it will experience a minimum of 20% revenue decline as a result of the shutdown. The primary way that this will be measured is by comparing April 2020 with April 2019 monthly revenue. Uh, but there are alternate measurements in place for businesses who were maybe established outside this window. And we also have a slide to show you what some of those uh, comparator points will be. 
And of course, applications for the new program opened today. So the, the portal that folks will take you through is now available for applications. Next slide, please. So there's just a couple of examples uh, on the slide, which we thought might be helpful to take folks through so you can kind of understand how those parameters that I just walked through sort of tangibly uh, work their way through the program. So we have kind of two companies, company A, company B on the bottom of the slide there. And I think we just assume that both these companies meet the business eligibility uh, test in terms of being shut down or significantly restricted. And if you look at company A on the left, so you'll see that it says there it'll experience a monthly loss of $20,000, which is equivalent in their context to a 25% decline in revenue. So that means they meet the 20% revenue test and they will be eligible for a $20,000 um, uh, grant, which is also the maximum, but it fully offsets the, uh, the revenue decline that's been uh, presented by the, by the company. And then on the, on the right, uh, there's a monthly loss of 15,000, which is also 20%. So they meet the 20% threshold uh, for the decline and that entire amount, 15,000 would, uh, would be funded. So turning the slide forward to talk a little bit about the revenue comparators. So as I mentioned before, businesses that perhaps were not in operation in April 2019 will still be able to calculate a revenue decline using various alternative revenue decline comparators. And the goal here is to uh, make sure that uh, all sm small businesses um, will be able to be eligible to apply uh, for the grant. Um, as you see, the chart on this slide shows the different comparators. So I think um, one thing you'll notice when you look at the comparators is what the program is trying to capture is two points in time, one where the business would have been kind of in normal operations versus when they would have been experiencing some kind of public health restriction. So for example, if you look at the second row in the chart, um, this is for a small business that went into operation after uh, April 2019 and so as a result couldn't use that more general comparator sometime between May 2019 and January 2020, the revenue comparator that they would use is February 2020 and um, April 2020. And when you think back, February was sort of a pre-pandemic, pre-lockdown, provincial lockdown uh, month, whereas April, uh, the province was in a lockdown scenario. And so as a result, it's meant to be a good representation of the impact that that business would have been experienced uh, in the current provincial shutdown. And then just a note at the bottom of the slide, uh, winter seasonal businesses will uh, also be permitted to apply. And there's an alternative revenue decline comparator of they can choose between December 2019 and December 2020 or January 2020, December 2020. And that's just a recognition that winter seasonal businesses may have a different um, rhythm and cadence to their business. And so we're providing some flexibility for those businesses. All right, and then slide five. Um, provides the list of eligible small business types. So these are ones that are subject to closures or significant restrictions under the current shutdown. Uh, as we mentioned, this is sort of the first test that businesses need to meet as part of the application process. Um, and if they meet this plus the revenue test, they will be able to receive a minimum of 10,000 and up to, up to 20,000. Um, for the period of the provincial shutdown, just wanted to note that this is also the list of businesses that will be eligible for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the property tax and energy rebate. So I know we're, we're focusing on this program, but it's just another reminder that there are other support programs in place uh, for businesses. So if they don't meet some of the other tests, for example, around revenue or employees, there are these other uh, rebates that we could also apply for. And it's all in the same portal, which makes it much easier for businesses to be able to enter that information. And then the, the footnote on the bottom there, just to be clear that there are businesses that are not eligible. And those include those that were already required to close prior to the introduction of the modified stage two measures in October. So that's kind of the starting point for determining business eligibility. And then of course, any essential businesses that are permitted to operate either within capacity restrictions or otherwise being essential are not eligible for the program. And so this is the final slide. and. Hopefully that gives you a good snapshot of program parameters and eligibility. And I will turn it over to, um, I guess, folks to take you through the, the portal itself. 
Thank you very much, uh, Tim. I appreciate you walking everyone through some of the finer details uh, of that small business support uh, grant and certainly encourage everyone uh, on the line uh, if you're eligible uh, to uh, explore it a little bit uh, more deeply, uh, but certainly submit an application uh, as well. Um, it is currently open and available uh, uh, for the next uh, little while. Um, with that, I'm going to next uh, turn it over to Manisha Agrawal, who's a representative of the of Government and Consumer Services, uh, who will walk you through the Teton uh, database and exactly how to submit an application to take advantage uh, of the small business support grant uh, that Tim just spoke about, but also with the uh, other programs, uh, the Main Street uh, Fund for the PPE grant, uh, as well as the uh, Energy Department as well. So, Manish, I'll turn it over to you to walk everyone through uh, the presentation. So I've heard about this new program, and I come to Ontario.ca uh, with this beautiful background. Here, I click on English, and I see the link where it says support we are providing for small business. So I want to know as a small business, uh, what kind of support I'm getting from the government of Ontario. I click on this link, which, which takes me to a page with all details about the different programs uh, that the government of Ontario is having for uh, in support of small businesses. Uh, I see here that there's a new program. I click on it, and it takes me to, to the page where uh, it provides me the list of the programs that are currently available, Ontario Small Business Support Grant, uh, Ontario Main Street Relief Grant, VP Support, Property Tax, Energy Cost Rebates, and what you need to apply. Uh, so the program information, uh, what the program is, uh, what I will get as, get as a small business, uh, what are the eligibility criteria, and uh, information about the other programs as well. So I decide to apply uh, for the Ontario Small Business Support Grant because I meet the eligibility criteria. I, I'll click on Apply for Funding. Now when I click for Apply for Funding, I'm going to take you to show you the test page because I don't want to overwhelm uh, the live system. So it brings me uh, to a page like this. So uh, what you have here is uh, here is that uh, get help button, uh, which allows me to get help from the contact center or get access to the program information guide. Uh, if I want to apply in French, I can switch to French as well. If I've already applied uh, for the other programs, I don't need to start a new application. I can resume the application or if I've saved the application for draft because I didn't add all the information, I can continue uh, with the same application. Or I can apply for funding. I can start with a new uh, application. So uh, given that I'm a new applicant, I'm going to click on apply for funding. And it brings me to this page where uh, I need uh, I need to check the eligibility if I can apply for these programs or not. I, by default, the new program is selected. I can select multiple programs if I'm interested, or I can just apply for that program. I click on check eligibility, which will again take me to a series of questions uh, to check my eligibility for the program. Uh, the first question for the small business support grant program is: Was my business required to close? temporarily or significantly uh, restrict services as a result of being subject to province-wide shutdown? I would say yes. Does your business have less than 100 employees? That's the definition for a small business. I would say yes. And is my business expecting at least a 20% revenue decline? Um, I have a handy reference to the business guide that I can access uh, if I want to know more information about what revenue decline means. I'll say yes, and then I click on next. Now, it says that I'm eligible for the following funding program uh, down to a small business grant. I'm going to start my application. Now, when I start my application, uh, it takes me to a, a series of steps. It's going to ask me to uh, provide my business information, my contact information, information related to the new Ontario Small Business Support Grant, then review all the information I provided in the three steps, provide my banking information, and submit. So I come here, I provide my legal name. If I'm running a small business, Olivia T room, so I provide the information. Um, I run it as store of happiness. And 
I provide my CRA business number. Now at this stage, I can validate the business number if I'm not sure if, the, if my business number is correct or not. If, if it's correct, I don't need to validate it there. Uh, if I don't know where to get the business number, I will provide a handy tip. Uh, it can be found on the GST, GST return or the employer payroll or T2 corporate tax filing. Now, if I'm a self proprietor who doesn't have a business number, we also provide a handy link on how to obtain the business number from the CRA website. The next step is to provide the address information. I can use address local file, postal code, or uh, if I know the address, I can directly key it in. Okay, so I have that. My mailing address is same as head office address. If it's different, uh, I can provide that as well. Click on next. Now uh, here I'm going to provide my contact information. Nash, last name is phone number and my email address. Okay, so I've provided information, I've confirmed my email address is that. Uh, it's very important to provide the correct email address, uh, validate it again, because that's the address that is being used uh, in terms of sending emails, confirming the receipt of your application, uh, confirming the payment process, and if you have to come back and resume your application. I'm going to confirm that I'm the owner and I have the signing authority uh, for the individual trust for the business. At this point, I can save a draft, which allows me to come back. If I don't have all the information, I can come back and uh, resume the application. All this information will be saved. I don't have to provide that information again. Click on next. Now here I'm going to provide information very specific to the Ontario Small Business Support Grant. Uh, right up front, we provide the application guide, uh, which the users can uh, review, the applicants can review uh, in case they have more questions or they want to find more about the program. Uh, I need to provide my business type and say it's restaurants and bars. Now it asks me if my question is part of an enterprise or an affiliated enterprise. Uh, we have a handy tip in terms of what it means, uh, enterprise, or they can refer to the application guide for more information. So my business is not part of an enterprise. So I'm not going to check that. Now here, uh, if, I, if I was having a winter seasonal business, uh, uh, like a you know a, a ski uh, a resort or uh, uh, any any business that is uh, uh, associated with winter uh, seasonal, I can say yes, and it will ask me a series of questions. Uh, if my business was in operation in the current business business structure in December 2019, if I say yes, uh, if you to ask me for my highest monthly revenue either in December 2019 or January 2020, given that many winter seasonal businesses don't start operating until January. For the purpose of this demo, I'll say no, my, my business is not, not a winter seasonal business. Then the next question is, was my business in operation in the current business structure in April 2019? If I say yes, it will ask me to provide number of employees, my revenue in April 2019, my revenue in April 2020. If I say no, uh, it asks me, it, it prompts me to provide my business full, first full month of operation, uh, you know, uh, the month. And based on that, it's going to ask me for the same information in terms of number of employees, what was my revenue, and in, in February 2020, what was my revenue in April 2020. Uh, for the purpose of the demo, again, I'll say yes, it was in business structure in operation in April 2019. Uh, the number of employees were 10. Uh, the revenue was 10,000 in April 2019. 
in April 2020, the revenue is 2000. And I attest that the information I'm providing is all good. I go through the terms and conditions. They agree. I've provided now information with respect to this program. I'll say next. Now here I can review all the information I've provided the business information, the contact information, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the information related to Ontario Small Business Support Grant. So all the information has been provided, it all looks good. I can go to the next step, which is to provide my banking information. There's a sample check, copy of sample check provided, just in case people want to see where their branch, or what their branch number, institution number and account number is located on the check. So I'll put that in here. And I'll select the institution number. Now there are many, many banks. We're just not limiting to the top five. Uh, yeah, there, there are, we cover uh, a broad spectrum of banks uh, within the province. and provide the account number, that's it. Then verify that all the information I provided is correct and click on submit. So when I click on submit, again, some terms and conditions, I'll be attesting as many Shagrawal that all the information I'm providing is true, agree and submit. So uh, once I do that, my application is submitted. And uh, uh, so it, it, it's just a test environment. So it's saying that there's a problem because I've already used the CRA business number. So we have a check as well to ensure that the CRA business number is not used again. Uh, there, there's only one application that can be submitted to that application. But once I click on submit, uh, I'll, uh, my application will be submitted and I'll, I'll get a, a, a notification uh, saying uh, that your submission, uh, your, your application has been submitted. Let me quickly share the email with you uh, on how it looks. Uh, the business will receive, a, receive an email similar to this, where it says that you've applied for this program, there's your authorization number, and uh, it's under review. And if it's approved, you will receive a subsequent confirmation email notifying that, that your payment has been processed. And that it takes around two weeks uh, to receive your payment once the application has approved. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Manish. Appreciate uh, you walking uh, everyone through exactly how to take advantage of uh, those uh, supports. Uh, um, as I said at the beginning, uh, I certainly encourage uh, everyone uh, to apply and take advantage uh, and submit an application um, as the, the, those programs are currently uh, soliciting applications. Uh, before I turn it back over to the Minister, I'd just like to remind everyone uh, that uh, today's presentation will be sent to you following uh, today's uh, call. Uh, we will uh, be sending it electronically as well as including uh, all the links uh, to uh, the application form uh, as well as uh, the uh, regulations and some of those upcoming uh, opportunities with the Ontario Trillium Foundation and the uh, Ontario Arts Council. Uh, but before we depart, I'll turn it over to Minister McLeod for some closing remarks. Minister, over to you. Sure, thanks very much. Um, perhaps maybe if, if uh, Sam, if you're interested in saying a few words before I, I conclude, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as all the participants would have seen, this is uh, clearly a, an opportunity to ensure that we're able to move through this stage of uh, COVID recovery, where as we're hopefully coming out of this uh, peak, out of the second wave, we're able to ensure that there's some liquidity in the system, but also hope. And I think yesterday's announcement was very much about providing that hope to small businesses and also to uh, people who have frankly been uh, locked up practically for the last 11 months. And I wanna be able to get out and experience so many of the beautiful things here in Niagara uh, from across the province. Uh, and we recognize that it's important to ensure that our local businesses, our local sites, our attractions are here uh, for when uh, people are able to travel more. Um, the minister has spoken as well last fall about uh, the tax credit coming for Ontarians to be able to uh, enjoy things in their own backyard, to enjoy tourism here in the, in the area. 
And I just want to encourage you to reach out if there's anything we can do to be of assistance. Uh, obviously, this has been an extremely challenging time. Uh, we're not saying that these are uh, the final answers to the challenges that are being faced, but they're uh, definitely evidence of our government's commitment and Minister McLeod's commitment to ensuring that we can get through this and recover stronger than ever. So that's my commitment. I always say I can't, can't wave a magic wand and fix everything, uh, but I promise to work hard uh, and listen to uh, all of you as we move forward. And I know that's a similar commitment from Minister McLeod. Uh, thanks very much, Sam. And I can't wait to see you in person, all of you, uh, when it's safe to do so. Uh, just to conclude, um, there are many business supports available as well as for our cultural museums uh, and our attractions. So please uh, feel free, if, if you have still further questions, to email me at minister.mcleod at ontario.ca. Uh, I'd be happy to, uh, to take any of your questions. And I, I know my team is working around the clock in order to get as much support out as we possibly can. Uh, keep your eyes out for the Ontario Trillium Foundation and the Ontario Arts Council. Uh, grants that are, are going to be uh, made available very imminently, as will the Reconnect 2021. And I do see my friend Janice Thompson is on the line. Janice, uh, your Reconnect has been approved for before Christmas, so I just wanted to let you know that. Uh, we have obviously not made a, a big announcement on these uh, given many of our festivals and events had to uh, either be repurposed or cancelled as a result of the lockdown orders. So uh, well, there will be a formal announcement very shortly, but I wanted you to know uh, that you were approved for that. So uh, thanks everyone very much and please stay safe and I'll look forward to getting down to Niagara Falls uh, when it's safe to do so uh, to, to make further announcements and how we can best support your region. Um, so all the very best friends and we'll talk to you uh, soon. Thanks everybody, have a good afternoon, good day. Thank you, have a good one.